Hi everyone, welcome back. Our next speaker is a uh, biomedical engineering graduate student and while she was studying diseased state neural circuitry at NIH, she had to take care of lots and lots of mice. She decided she needed a better solution, so she made some machinery to do it herself and open sourced everything. Open source uh, scientific apparatus is a really big deal right now and is going to help push help make the jobs of multiple labs a lot easier and push science forward faster. So that's a big win for everyone. And with that in mind, I'd like you to welcome to the Hagaday Supercon stage, Katrina Nguyen. Thank Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. So it's a great pleasure to be here today to share some of my work with you. Uh, so, as noted, I am a graduate student currently studying at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, I'm going to share with you uh, kind of the process I went through to 3D design and 3D print uh, uh, some, some hardware and uh, couple it with some open source uh, circuits to uh, ultimately automate my job of uh, feeding mice, which I had to do uh, a lot of. So. Four years ago, I joined a lab at the National Institutes of Health, NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, because I wanted to study and learn more about neuroscience. Uh, and in this lab, we're interested in studying what neural circuits uh, derive uh, eating, uh, obesity, and addiction. So what neural circuits are responsible for certain behaviors that we do. Uh, to put it more simply, if you uh, have a mouse and you give it an option, uh, of a high-fat diet versus a, a low-fat uh, standard diet, uh, it's an easy choice. He's going to go for the high-fat diet and barely touch the other option. Uh, so we want to study this uh, in more detail as researchers. So what happens when you have different combinations of diets, uh, different flavors, different uh, uh, values of diet? Uh, what happens when you restrict the, the uh, uh, presence of the food to only certain hours of the day? Uh, how would this ultimately affect their feeding behavior? Uh, and more interestingly, how would this affect the neural activity? So how would neural activity now respond to, uh, to food when they, they get it? Um, so I, when you do this, you want really detailed information uh, about food consumption. So high uh, resolution, accurate, precise data. So you can really couple this behavioral data with the neural activity you're recording. And when I started in the lab, I uh, was very surprised to find out that collecting this uh, high fidelity, high resolution information uh, feeding data in mice is actually a very challenging problem. Um, it's very difficult, especially when you're looking to do it uh, in a high throughput manner. So if you want many mice, uh, many data points. Um, there are a bunch of commercial systems that you can purchase that uh, allow you to collect this, this sort of data. Uh, but they're often really expensive. They run uh, up to tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, they take up a lot of space. So not only do you have the system, but you need specialized caging. You need a special data acquisition system to acquire all the data. Um, and you're often confined within the limits and the boundaries that, that this company defines for you. Uh, so what happens is, as an experimenter, you're planning your designs and your experiments around the system's capabilities. Uh, so you're kind of compromising. So all of these kind of uh, added up, and um, not many people can afford these systems. So what's done uh, in many labs is uh, collecting these, uh, this data is done manually. Uh, so what you have in this picture here is you have a mouse, and what you have are these food dishes, these food cafes. And what goes uh, on is a researcher, so myself, has to come in every morning uh, we get a d cafe, we pack some food in it, we put it on a kitchen scale, take that weight, and we come back 24 hours later, some time later, take another measurement, and that difference in the weight is presumably how much the mouse ate. Uh, so you, as you can imagine, uh, if we're interested in this data, that's a very crude coarse measurement. Um, it's imprecise, and what you're missing is you're missing a lot of the the feeding uh, behavior that happens in between this 24 hours, so the microstructure of the feeding patterns. Uh, 
This process is also very time consuming. So if you have a, a cohort of mouse, mice, uh, it takes upwards to three or four hours every morning to go in and change the food and do all the weighing. Uh, and if you're like me and you have to commute into work every morning, uh, you have to account for the time uh, that it takes. So I commuted from Fairfax, Virginia to Bethesda, Maryland in the morning. And if I uh, left my house about five minutes later than I should have, uh, my maps looked something like this. So my typical 30 minute route uh, doubled in time. It took over an hour. And this is really important because when you're studying behavior and you're studying uh, neuroscience, uh, it's very time sensitive. So when you start an experiment, you wanna run it at the same time every single day. So you're taking accurate measurements, uh, making re reproducible results. So this kind of all built up and I finally threw up my hands and said, we need a better system to do this. We need a, a better system uh, to acquire this data. Uh, and in thinking about the designs and thinking of how to uh, design a system that can do this, we had made some guidelines. We wanted it to be flexible, so you can easily reprogram it, uh, modify it to uh, your needs. We wanted it to be affordable, so relatively uh, cheap components, um, and we wanted to open source it. So the first thing we started was with the circuit. Uh, it's a pretty simple circuit, so what we have here is we have our device, uh, it interfaces with the mouse, and we need to deliver the food source. So here we're using these little food pellets. And when the food pellet is available, we need to detect whether it is absent or present. And the way we used, uh, the way we did that was we used a photo interrupter board, so infrared photo interrupter board to detect uh, whether or not the pellet was there. So if a pellet is taken, the, the signal changes from a low to a high, and I'll trigger this series, next series of events. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to log the data. So we uh, record that, yes, a pellet was taken. We timestamp it, and then we trigger uh, a, a five volt stepper motor to rotate and deliver the next pellet. So these are the, the designs, uh, the hardware that I chose to use for this first uh, iteration of our device. We have a Arduino uh, Pro microcontroller paired with a photo interrupter board from SparkFun. And then we have a data locking shield and a motor shield from Adafruit coupled with a five volt stepper motor. So that was the easy part. Uh, the hard part uh, for me was actually designing uh, the hardware, the outer part that would hold all the food, contain all the food, and, and uh, be the interface that the mouse interacts with. Um, and when we set out to, to build this device, uh, we knew we wanted it to be 3D printed to keep the cost down. And luckily for us uh, is that 3D printers, desktop 3D printers were becoming more affordable, uh, more accessible at this time. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be, uh, have access to one that I could use uh, for free. And this was a huge driver in allowing me to uh, have this project progress and move forward uh, quickly and smoothly as it did. So this was my first uh, attempt in designing this. This was, uh, I was very new to CAD. I had never designed or printed anything before. And I quickly moved from the open source uh, Tinkercad to more sophisticated products like uh, SolidWorks or Autodesk Inventor. So this design I thought would be great initially. We had a uh, sort of a food well at the bottom. And we, that's, where we, that's where we would hold all our food and we would have a, a spoon that would make a 360 degree rotation, scoop up a single pellet every time and deliver it to the mouse. Um, and that just did not work. So after uh, some brainstorming, we decided that the best option and the best design was to have a food silo on top uh, that would be delivered, uh, that would deliver a single pellet to a, an opening at the bottom, sort of like a, a candy uh, machine, a quarter candy machine. And even so, uh, with this design and with this design in mind, uh, there's so many ways you can build this, so many ways you can hold the pellet, so many ways that you can construct uh, the rotating motor this that dispenses and uh, filters out the pellets to only deliver one. Um, so there were a lot of attempts, and my desk that I was working at quickly turned into something that looked like this. Uh, we called it the 3D printing graveyard uh, for, for my uh, designs. 
and it just happened that these parts either didn't uh, print or, or turn out the way we wanted it to. And as a result, some of the circuits and electronics had to change because we had to reposition or reorient uh, the, the parts. Uh, but finally, after uh, uh, months of work, we finally got something to work. Uh, so this is the feeding experimentation device, is what we named it, FED for short. And uh, you see this is the final picture of everything put together and constructed on the left-hand side. And this is uh, it in a cage with a mouse on the right-hand side. And you can see the mouse interacts with it just fine. It's not afraid of it, learns almost immediately that this is where the food comes out and this is how I'm going to take it out. So the entirety of FED can be printed on a standard desktop 3D printer. And we actually was, uh, were able to orient all the parts uh, to print in one single build plate. Uh, so we have the base and the doors and all the, the disk and components all fit into a single plate. And it takes about 24 hours to print a single uh, complete housing. So this was also designed for researchers and neuroscientists in mind. Uh, and oftentimes, people who come from uh, this sort of background don't have experience uh, in, in 3D printing or, or even any circuits. So we wanted to keep things simple. Along with the electronics, we wanted to keep the outer assembly simple as well. So here, uh, we utilized a lot of uh, kind of a twist and lock mechanism. So besides from the, the stepper motor that's mounted by two screws, everything connects together uh, and you twist and lock things so it's simple, it minimizes uh, the need for any external components and screws, uh, and it keeps everything kind of self-contained and easy to build so that it's not intimidating for someone who has uh, no background in printing or any circuits to, to make one of these themselves. And lastly, all the electronics that we saw earlier in the previous slides are all contained in the bottom housing. Uh, so you can see that's where the Arduino is stored, and it's all enclosed and encased uh, with a sliding door in the back uh, to keep everything contained. So this is the part that the mouse interacts with uh, the most. This is our uh, opening, and this is what we call our food well. And uh, what happens is the pellet is dispensed. Uh, it falls down uh, this, this funnel that guides it down to this well. And when it makes it down into its well, uh, what it does is it breaks that infrared uh, uh, signal from the photo interrupter beam. So it turns from a high to low, and it tells the system not only that a pellet is dispensed, but to stop rotating a motor, to stop the turning, uh, no more dispensing pellets, and wait until another one is uh, removed. So now that we have the complete prototype, uh, it's time to test it. Uh, does this thing actually work when we put it uh, to work. So this is some data that, uh, this is the first sort of data that we were collecting uh, from the device. Uh, so this is one mouse, uh, two days. Uh, the blue curves are day one, and the orange curves are day two of testing. Uh, for the current setup with uh, our battery pack that we're using, we find that uh, we can run this system for about five to seven days continuously until uh, it runs out of power and you need to replace the battery or recharge it. And what you can see on the, the bottom right-hand figure is uh, a nice detailed uh, data collection and display of the data. So these vertical raster plots, these vertical ticks, is uh, an instance that uh, a pellet was removed. Um, so you can not only get you know, how much the mouse eat in this 24-hour period by summing up all of those uh, ticks, but you can start to really dissect the microstructure of the feeding patterns, look at what's going on, uh, is he eating in, in bouts. Um, and if you look closely uh, towards the left-hand side of this figure, you'll see uh, more, uh, a higher density of ticks. And this turns out that uh, the left-hand part of the graph is uh, the mouse's uh, night cycle. And this makes sense because mice are nocturnal and uh, they're active and they're uh, more active and they feed more during the night. So you can capture all this information. So another really cool thing about the device is that it's self-contained. So not only can you throw it in a standard colony cage, but you can also integrate it with uh, other existing systems. 
Um, so it's battery powered. This is a uh, place in a, another system. And it also has a BNC cable. And this BNC cable allows you to uh, send information to the device to either trigger the dispensal, dispensing of a pellet, or you can do uh, the opposite and have the signal output a signal, uh, the device output a signal and trigger some external uh, uh, input. So before I play this video, uh, the neuroscience field, the biology of it, uh, has really come a long way, and it's super sophisticated. Uh, and you can use a lot of techniques and methodology to really tar uh, tease apart the neural circuits that drive behavior. Uh, one such technique is called optogenetics. And with optogenetics, you can deliver a virus into a specific uh, area of the brain. And when this virus expresses, uh, it turns specific neurons and has it uh, activated, uh, so you can modulate the activity by, by light. Uh, so in this uh, video, I have a mouse, and I did the surgery to express this virus, and we implanted an optical fiber to deliver pulses of light. And uh, more specifically, this guy has, uh, uh, th this target is in a brain area that when you stimulate, uh, it drives feeding. So you can see when I turn on the light, you get these blue pulses of stimulation. He goes from his resting state, he goes over to the food well, and he's going to take a pellet, he's going to eat it, and then another one will dispense and wait for him to, to take it again. So all this data is logged, and you can really start to tie in uh, how does behavior and how does neural activity uh, correlate with each other. Of course, with all projects like this, there are limitations. Uh, so these are the three main limitations uh, that this device has. Uh, the first one is that the pellets uh, sometimes bounce out. So if the pellet falls too quickly or it just hits the well at the perfect angle, it'll, it'll actually bounce out of that food well opening. And what happens when this uh, occurs is that the, the system, the photo detector, doesn't detect that, uh, that event. So the, the mouse is able to eat the, the food pellet, but we're not logging the data. The second is uh, sometimes there's a dispensing of two pellets instead of one because there is a, a misread of the, the detection. And the last thing uh, that uh, we're limited with this system is that it only detects the pellet retrieval. So not consumption. It can, so the mouse can take a bunch of these pellets uh, if he's a hoarder, he can take it and store it in a corner, and we wouldn't know unless we went in and manually checked the, the cage for this. Uh, but I did run some control experiments to see uh, how often these errors were occurring. And we found that uh, our system fed logged uh, these uh, pellets accurately 95% of the time, while the, the latter 5% of the time uh, missed it because one of these three reasons. So we are still continuing to work on updating and advancing uh, FED. Uh, what I showed you uh, for all the videos uh, previously is a free feeding paradigm where if a pellet was taken from the well, another one would automatically dispense. Uh, but you can imagine uh, you can code more sophisticated programs. Uh, so this one right here is what we call uh, operant training. So instead of getting the pellets for free, we have to teach the mouse that he actually has to poke a certain pattern uh, to receive the reward. Uh, and this particular pattern that we uh, coded is he has to poke left, right, right. Um, and if you put it in the cage for a couple of days, uh, they do learn it. So he gets it, he gets a reward cone, and, he, and he's excited, and he grabs a pellet from the well. Um, the second thing is we want to switch out the microcontroller we're using now. So instead of the Arduino Pro, maybe use a microcontroller with Wi-Fi capabilities. Uh, this way we can stream uh, the data online uh, to some server and look at uh, real-time performance and real-time uh, behavior. This way we can monitor the mice uh, when we're elsewhere, and we can also get uh, warning messages or errors if, let's say, one of the systems hasn't dispensed a pellet for, for over an hour. We know that something might be wrong. So all of this is open source. We have all the files, uh, all the design and drawings and code up online on several uh, platforms, Hackaday included. 
And uh, I've been excited to see that other labs that do research, that do feeding research, have actually found their way uh, to our defi device and uh, have actually built and implemented it themselves in their labs. So here are just a few examples of labs all over the world um, who have uh, made it for themselves and to kind of improve the research, uh, save some time, save their energy, and get really high resolution data. Another big benefit of uh, having open source uh, projects is you get better improvements. Uh, so just these are two examples of labs or companies that have taken the design files and improved it. Uh, the one on the left is by a company called LabMaker. And what they did is they modified the, the bottom base and they uh, inserted compartments to hold the battery, to hold the Arduino, to hold the motor nicely. And it, uh, just gave it a more organized look and it made it easier to build. The one on the right is from a lab at Duke University who also studies feeding. And they did something really cool and added a second food silo to this system. Uh, so this way they were able to uh, use two different types of pellet and look at how frequent the mouse uh, visited one well versus the other. So you can really start to look at uh, choice preferences and uh, other uh, questions similar to that. Uh, and to kind of conclude, I'd like to give a, a nod to Hackaday uh, and their collaboration with Open Behavior, uh, which has been hosting similar projects, uh, neuroscience, open source projects uh, like this to study neuroscience in a better uh, way. And this allows for uh, more frequent documentation, uh, more updated codes, more updated files, uh, which is uh, extremely beneficial to the field. Um, currently, the best way to kind of publish and, and share, share your data is by pub publishing papers in the neuroscience and research fields. And this process can be lengthy and take up to, to a year um, to, to from start to finish. So being able to upload new files and new code uh, weekly or daily uh, is really beneficial to other people who are, who are interested in your work. Uh, as we've seen the past two days, we have an awesome community of makers and hackers uh, that uh, love to tinker with stuff and take files like this and just improve upon them. Uh, I feel like one person's uh, ideas are, are limited and you could add more and more people and you have unlimited resources and ideas to, to improve designs. Uh, I've already gotten some comments and feedback on, on this device uh, to uh, reduce power consumption and prolong battery life. And we've also gotten some uh, feedback on how we can possibly uh, change our design of the, the funnel, the food well interface to decrease the frequency of these, these errors that we're getting. And the last thing I'd like to say is uh, having a transparency in your methods uh, in, in the code you're using to run the programs, uh, how you're running the data, how you're analyzing data, uh, it's it's going to be extremely beneficial in uh, having uh, reproducibility in science uh, be, uh, be more uh, prevalent uh, and accessible. Um, so even small details like how long did you wait until a pellet was dispensed can be extremely important in the results you found, but these details might uh, often be missed or not included in published papers, whereas if you have the code uh, posted online, Someone could go through it, download it, and uh, look through exactly all the parameters and metrics that you're using. And with that, I'd like to thank the lab I worked with, the team, and uh, Hackaday and their team for organizing uh, such an awesome conference. Thanks. <laughs>